Our theme for these next three nights is rediscovering God's fullness in your life. And so we want to look at related topics to rediscovering, restoring, rekindling, rebuilding, to help us to become more fully focused on the most important things for our lives. I think that most of us have had wonderful glimpses of the Lord and his purposes for our lives. But there are also many other things in life that try to distract us away from focusing on our high calling and from the life of God that seeks to abundantly indwell among us. It's so easy for us to let God's fullness in our life to slowly slip away or melt away and we're, while we're not even noticing it. So many times we fall into repeated daily patterns or rituals where the life of God just seems to slowly diminish in our lives. For the Ephesian church, it was that they had lost, they had left their first love. They had still a love, but it was slowly slipping away, melting away. For the Laodicean church, we find that they had become lukewarm. Again, still serving the Lord, but something was just slipping away. We find for Martha in the Gospels, our Lord said, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. And oh, how easy it is to get worried and troubled about things in these last days. We can find in the story of the ten virgins that five of them had not taken extra oil for their lamps. And it started to go out just when they needed it the most. So in these stories and in many other ways, we can find ourselves serving the Lord, seeking to be good Christians, while sometimes we're losing focus and the most important things in our Christian life slowly melt away or slip away. And so we want to refocus and rediscover these next three nights. And let's look at some scriptures that can help point us in the right direction. Let's quote a few important verses that can help guide us and motivate us as we are to seek for God's highest. In Ephesians 3, verse 16 and 17, we are told we are to be strengthened with might in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Then we find that Ephesians 4.13 says that we are to grow until we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Not just a little bit of Christ within us, but we are to grow towards the fullness of Christ being in our lives and in the body of Christ. In Romans 8.29, we're given the wonderful promise that we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God's plan from before creation was that he would have many sons to glory. We were predestined for this as we run our race to obtain this high and holy calling. And then we are told that from the beginning... The Lord said to himself, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. That is God's purpose for you and me, that we are to become made in his image and likeness. That's from the beginning, and he's going to fulfill it by the end. Then we can also read in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a future hope that we are going to become the glorified sons and daughters of God. But it's a vision. It's a goal. It's something that we will obtain by his grace and mercy. And we want to not just obtain it 30-fold or 60-fold, but by God's grace, we want to obtain a 100-fold portion of God's glory for our lives, for eternity to come. Because we're also told in Ephesians 2, 7, 
that God's purpose stretches into the ages to come, that he, God, might show the exceeding riches of his grace toward us in Christ Jesus. The age is to come. And from the Greek, that says, in the age after age, after age, after age. We are living in the church age until Christ returns. Then there will be the millennial kingdom age for a thousand years. Then we read at the beginning of Revelation 21, there will be a new heaven and a new earth where there will be many more ages and where the Lord will say to us, he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he will be my son. That and so many other scriptures and revelations want to show us more of God's purposes and what mighty power he wants to have working within our lives now and in a growing way for the ages, for eternity to come. Now, the Apostle Paul saw a glimpse of the greatness of God's calling when the Lord Jesus appeared to him in heaven when he was on the road to Damascus. And when he saw the glory of the Lord and had a glimpse of his calling and what it was to become a Christian, he said years later to King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. From the moment he saw the glory of the Lord, it was enough for him to sell out for God. And then he wrote years later, while still maturing his ministry, he said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Until at the end of his life, in his last letter, brought out from the dungeon from which he was taken out to become a martyr, his last letter, his last resounding message for his life, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to stay focused. But what about us? Are we staying always focused on God's highest and best? Life goes by day after day, and so often we get distracted from what should remain our life's focus, from what should remain the heavenly vision that can burn bright in each of our lives. And as we've gone through these last years of the pandemic, Sometimes it seemed that life is going nowhere, just sitting at home, nothing is moving on, our life rearranged, new limitations, and sometimes it has seemed that life could have become boring or just the same, week after week, month after month, and our plans and goals that we had for the future for some of us, for these last few years, have seemed like they were put on hold. But does life have to be slipping by around us these last few years? No, not at all. Do our Christian goals and vision need to be put on hold? Do we need to feel like we're just spinning our wheels and going nowhere? Not at all. And that's what we want to refocus upon these next three days of seminar. Now, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, tells us, For this reason, we must pay closer attention to the things we have heard, or we may drift away. If you're in a boat, asleep, or ignoring what's going on around you, that boat can just slowly start drifting away in the tide, or in the breeze, and it might go off direction more and more off course, slowly, while we don't even seem to notice it. That's why we need to pay closer attention to the things we have heard, to the heavenly high calling that we have been given, so that 
our life doesn't slowly slip away into defeat or into deception. It can be like a frog that's left in a pot of warm water. The frog can be content in that warm water, but if the water is slowly made hotter and hotter, the frog will not notice it until that clueless frog, sorry, froggy, until that froggy gets cooked and dies. They just can't notice if it's slowly getting hotter and dangerous for them. And so we don't want to be like a clueless frog. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, we are told the beginning of a story, and it starts out saying, at the time when kings go out to battle, and we won't read the whole story, but it's about when David, instead of, as the king, leading his troops out to battle, it was the time of year when the roads were good, the rains and mud were gone, it was the time of warfare, and David should have been leading his king, his, his army, but instead, he stayed at home. He had a comfortable palace. He had a good army. He could just send Joab, his army commander, and the troops, and he could just relax at home in his comfortable palace and just relax. Everything was fine. And he didn't recognize the warning that was later written in Scripture by Amos. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. As a result, when David just got more and more comfortable and clueless that his spiritual life was slipping away, that he wasn't fighting the good fight of faith. He was just enjoying being a comfortable king. Well, when he didn't go out to conquer uh, other nations, he noticed his beautiful next-door neighbor and instead got distracted and decided he would conquer her. And we know the story of King David and Bathsheba when he should have been out fighting the battles of the Lord. Instead, he stayed at home, comfortable and growing spiritually weak and unable to resist the temptation that came. Now, as I was preparing this message, the Lord quickened to me a word of knowledge that there will be some listening to this message tonight that God wants to speak to, that are at ease in Zion. It's been comfortable the last few years. Things have just been okay. We haven't had to travel. Some haven't had to work. And sometimes, even as Christian ministers, we can just delegate out that everybody else does the work, and we just stay comfortable at home, at ease in Zion. But in that comfort, you might be growing spiritually weak. We need to heed the exhortation of Isaiah 52 that says, Awake! Awake! Put on your strength! Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem! Shake yourself from the dust! Rise up, sit enthroned! Free yourself from the chains on your neck! O captive daughter of Zion. A warning for us. David was a man after God's own heart. And yet in his comfort and success, he drifted away for a short and terrible season of his life into terrible backsliding. It brought great damage to his kingdom, to his family, and to his own soul. David experienced several seasons of discouragement and failure in his life. Three times in the Psalms, he wrote, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope in God. I will praise him again. And he was just, just, why, why am I so discouraged? Why am I depressed? Why am I cast down? Now, what did he mean when he said that his soul was cast down? 
Well, we need to understand that that was a term used by shepherds. And remember, David had been a shepherd. And what it means is that a sheep that is cast down, rolled over on its side and tried to find a nice comfortable place to rest, but then he rolled a little too far and his legs were all sticking up and he couldn't get back up. Kicking, wiggling, he was stuck. And the dangerous thing for a sheep is that if he is upside down for more than a few hours, his blood circulation stops correctly, uh, bloating air starts to fill his stomach, and within a few hours on a hot day, a sheep can die. Or within 24 hours on a, a cooler, shady day. But very soon, if that sheep can't rescue himself, if he's cast down, he will die unless a shepherd intervenes and lifts him back up. And so there were times when David's soul had become cast down. He couldn't pick himself back up. And have you ever felt like that? Have you ever had a season in your life where you just didn't feel like you could pray? It wasn't worth trying to pray through because it's just not working. You're trying to read the Bible and it doesn't go, you don't go anywhere. It doesn't mean anything. And there are times we can seem cast down and unable to pick ourselves back up. That's when we need to call on the Lord and let the Lord be our good shepherd that will restore our soul. And so we want the Lord to restore our soul. If we have weakness, if we've been at ease in Zion, if we've just seemed to be going nowhere and, and we're drifting, Maybe we've lost our first love like the Ephesians or, or we're, we're replacing spiritual things with natural blessings like, like the Laodicean church. Maybe we're like David. We're delegating and letting other people fight the battles of the Lord while we're just kind of comfortable. Well, I'm the king. I'm the senior pastor. I can get everybody else to do it and I'll take another nap. Well... Whoa, we need to look up and find a rediscovering of the fullness of God for our lives and for our souls. Christ wants to restore us from our failures and also from hurts and bondages that we may have had, we may have been in bondage to, maybe we did wrong things in our teenage years. Maybe there were really wrong things that happened to us when we were little children. And those things put deep within our soul hurts, wounds, fears, anxieties, anger. And we need to have our souls restored. Many things can leave us with hurts and bondages, can be child abuse or poverty, can work very deep within a person's heart and change the rest of their life. Fears, unforgiveness, rejection. If you were rejected as a child or a teenager and, and, and you just were not in the right group and, and you were a loner and those things can warp our soul unless the Lord Jesus restores our soul. Sexual abuse for a young person can put great wounds within their life and can open them up to demonic attack for years to come unless they have those hurts healed by the great shepherd. Bullying can mar a person's soul and life. Pornography can bring lingering damage to a person's mind and heart. Teen rebellion can damage us for years. 
wrong relationships can put someone in bondage, sometimes for the rest of their life if they don't find a healing. And these things, at times, can put deep wounds in our hearts and minds and wrongly influence us even years after we become Christians. We're Christians, we love the Lord, we're trying to press on in God, but we still have these hurts, these wounds that have not yet been restored. We've heard the call to press on toward the mark, but we've got chains around us. We've got weights dragging us down even years after we have become Christians. We can sometimes smile and say, praise the Lord, and inside we're dying. Ever happened to you? Okay, yes, we want to be good Christians, but not fake Christians. And sometimes there is a very fine, invisible line between being full of faith and being full of fake, okay? And so by God's grace, we need to be healed from these hurts and bondages. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to help a wounded cat. A cat got a bad cut on it, and it goes back in a corner somewhere and hides. And you know that it needs medicine put on it. Has anybody here tried to help a wounded cat? You did try to get near it? Well, <laughs> what were the results? The results, <laughs> okay. They're going to get vicious because a cat, cats are independent, and when they're threatened with sickness and pain and danger, they will fight against anyone who tries to help them. Not like a dog. Oh, dogs, we've got dogs here at Zimai, okay? Dogs are different. Dogs, they're loving, and if they're wounded, they'll usually let you put, you know, some antibiotic on them, and, and that's a different story. But what happens to us when we're hurt, okay? Sometimes a Christian sees you're hurting and wants to come up and help you. Oh, I see you're really fighting that problem. You've had that oh, all your life. Please let me help you. And, and what response do we get back? Okay. Or sometimes they'll say, you want to help me with my problem? You're the one with the problem. Right? Those things happen. And yet, we need to have God's grace working on us transforming us, restoring our souls. At the beginning of his ministry, the Lord Jesus, de uh, okay, these hurts and bondages can hinder us from fully following God unless they are healed. Hebrews 12, 1 tells us, laying aside every weight and the sin that can so easily entangle us, let us run with perseverance the race set before us. If we're tangled with sin, if we're burdened with weights, worries and problems and hurts from the past, then it's difficult to run and persevere in our Christian race. But that's where the Lord wants to come and help us as our good shepherd, to restore our soul, to lift us up when we've fallen down and we just don't know how to get back up. At the beginning of his ministry, the Lord Jesus declared, quoting from Isaiah 61, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And sometimes, even after we become Christians, we still need healing for areas of a broken heart. Or there's still areas where we are in captivity to the past. And we need the Lord to release us to liberty. That is what Christ came to do. And so by God's grace, we want to start pressing on 
toward that mark of the high call of God. How? If we're cast down, if we're just kicking our legs and can't move, we can't do it. But how can we be set free when we can't set ourselves free? Number one, cry out to God. Cry out to God when there are troubles that are beyond what we can handle. In Psalm 107, we have a series of situations, stories about uh, different types of people that faced different problems in their lives. And we won't thoroughly look at it. We just want to get the basic idea. In Psalm 107, the first group of people that's talked about in the first story, it says, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord. And when they cried out to the Lord, he delivered them from their distress and led them to a dwelling place and to a city where men can praise the Lord. What turned them around from their wanderings, from their not knowing what direction to go, it's when they cried out to God. But the second story doesn't tell us about wanderers. Starting in verse 10, we read about rebels or backsliders. There it says, verse 10, those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death bound in afflictions and irons because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. They rebelled against God. They were rebellious backsliders. It says then that God brought them down and there was none to help that they became prisoners as we will see. But in their distress, when there was no one to help, verse 13, when they cried to the Lord in their trouble, he saved them and brought them out of darkness. He broke their chains in pieces. When? Again, when they cried out to the Lord. Okay? When I was a young Christian, I had, I really loved the Lord. I was set free from so many things. And I, I loved the Lord, but I also still had some bondages. And I can remember when I went to Bible school as a young Christian, I was so excited. Oh, I'm called to serve the Lord. I'm here at Bible school preparing. But one of my many problems was that when I was a, a rebel, rock and roll, uh, musician, and uh, druggie, uh, I had taken a lot of illegal drugs that had blown my mind. I could no longer think properly. I could keep my mind focused on something for two or three seconds, whoop, then I was in another world, whoop then I was in it. Now, my wife sometimes says, I still have that problem, but uh, I maintain I have been healed, okay? <laughs> and what happened was, there was a certain rule at the Bible school that I kept breaking. It wasn't a bad rule, just don't sit in the chairs here in the lounge, and, and I had to walk through there and stand there every day, and without thinking, I just sit down. And one of the teachers, the third time in a row, he saw me do that. He said, go to the office. And I went, Gloop. And I was very much afraid that they were going to send me out of Bible school. They thought I was rebellious. No, I was just burned out and just couldn't obey the most simple little thing. The third time it happened, I was saying to myself, do not sit down in the seats. Do not sit down in the seats. Do not. And while I was saying that to myself, do not sit down in the seats, I sat down in the seats, okay? Because I had wrecked my mind as a teenager 
before I turned to Christ. And I went and I, I blubbered and cried and, and apologized to the dean of men. And I said, I didn't mean it on purpose. I'm not a rebel. And uh, he let me go out of the office because I was so noisy and needed so many Kleenex. And uh, he didn't tell me if I was, you know, kicked out of school. Uh, I didn't know. Well, I went down to a prayer room all alone. And there I left a puddle of tears and mucus on the floor, crying out to God, Lord, how can I ever be your servant when I can't even think straight? God, unless you heal me from my sinful uh, 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 drugs I took when I was a teenager, Lord, I'm never going to be able to serve you. I'm never going to be a preacher. And I cried out with all of my heart, I didn't want to be kicked out of Bible school. I didn't want to be a reject, wounded beyond hope by my former sins. And when I rose up from that prayer room and cleaned up my mess and went out, I was a changed person. I could think straight for the first time in years. And praise God, the Lord worked. They didn't kick me out of school. I got great A's and, and improved and, and graduated with honors. And uh, I trust I'm still running a good race today. That was 1977. That's uh, 45 years later, okay? Still running a good race by God's grace. But I would have never been able to do it if God had not reached down and set the captive free. Not when I was saved. I was already saved. I was already baptized in the Holy Spirit. But there was still something in my life that needed healing if I was going to become a, 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 a dedicated, fruitful, balanced servant of God. And so... The rebels in chains, they had to cry out to God, just like the wanderers that didn't know where to go. It's when they cried out to God that God helped them. And the next story we read about, starting in verse 17 of Psalm 107, says, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul hated to eat food. They draw near the gates of death. They were sick. They didn't want to eat. They were dying because of their foolishness and the sins they had foolishly committed. And then it says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distress. It says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. And you read all through this psalm, and you read that all of the difficulties, many types of difficulties that people can face for many reasons in life, when we, cannot, when we can't save ourselves, when we can't rescue ourselves from reaping what we have sown, if we will cry out to God with all of our heart, God will heal and will come to rescue us. I know it. And I believe every one of you can know it and have a full release if you cry out to God. Now that is the first and foremost thing that we need to do if we need to be set free from something in the past that we just can't correct ourselves. We need to cry out to the wonderful, great shepherd that can stand us back on our feet, pat us on our head, and say, like he said to Peter, when Peter said, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Jesus said, don't be afraid. You're not going to be a fisher of fish anymore. You're going to be a fisher of men. God encouraging him along. And setting him free to run the race with freedom. And so, that's the first thing we need to do. But a second thing 
is often needed, not always, but often. If you cry out to God with all your heart and that's not the full answer, then another high possibility is that we need to fully forgive those who have hurt us. To be set free from the past, Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our sins or our trespasses as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, he said, if we forgive those who sinned against us, our heavenly Father will forgive us. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow. That is fearsome. The fear of the Lord. The beginning of wisdom. If we do not forgive others, we will not be forgiven. And sometimes a person can be hurt so bad that they might say, for a day, for a month, even for years, I will never forgive them for what they did. Have you ever heard anyone say that? I hope it's not you. <laughs> or if it's you, I hope that is long gone in your past, okay? That you found release. But we need to forgive others so that we are set free. We find that in the parable of the unforgiving servant that he was delivered over to the tormentors until he paid everything. He hadn't fully forgiven, and he was delivered to tormentors. Now, in the natural, if you owe money and you can't pay the debts, the, you know, uh, Palo on Pawn Shop or whoever you have your debt to, you know, they might after a while get angry and send you threatening notes, and, you know, angry texts, and uh, then uh, letters uh, left on your doorstep. And if that doesn't work, the time might come when crash. A stone will come through the window where you're staying or you're walking down the street and somebody beats you up and things can get worse and worse, delivered over to the tormentors. But Jesus said, our heavenly Father will allow us to come into bondage, into torment, if we will not fully forgive others. And if we don't forgive them, if we say, well, you just don't know how wrong they really did that. If we keep that, they are not the main ones suffering. You are the main ones suffering. If you can't release them, then you are the one that is keeping that bitterness or that anger or that revenge, or whatever those wrong attitudes are that can make us prisoners in our soul. Now, many of you know the story in Genesis 41 that when Joseph had two sons born to him in Egypt, he named his firstborn, interpreted from the Hebrew, forgetful or forgetting. He said, because God has caused me to forget all my suffering in my father's house. And after he forgave and forgot, his second son he named was Ephraim, which means fruitful. For now God has made me fruitful. But before Joseph could become fruitful, he first had to forgive and forget. If we don't forgive and forget, we're not free to press on in God. Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind and pressing on to the things that are ahead. I press to the mark of the high call of God. You can't be free to run forward if you're being dragged down and hindered by the things of the past. 
And so we need to forgive and forget. And if you keep remembering someone that hurt you, and you just think about it time after time, every so often it just pops up, oh, oh, that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong. And if you keep thinking about that years after it happened, if you haven't forgotten it yet, it's because you have not yet fully forgiven them. So give yourself that test. Do you keep remembering those evil things that happened to you? Yes, they were wrong. Yes, that person sinned against you. That, yes, that was terrible. But we need to forgive so that our Heavenly Father will forgive us. And so, if you still remember those wrong things that happened to you, you are not yet free to fully run after the Lord. And you need to really get serious praying. Lord, I pray that you'll just really forgive that man, Lord. He did me so much wrong, but that's past, Lord. I pray, Lord, you will save his soul. He is going to suffer, not just in this life. He'll suffer for eternity. Lord, save his soul. Have mercy on him. Forgive him, Lord. And if we will fully release someone from our heart, then we are fully released to run after God. So key number one, cry out to God. And if that isn't enough, then you need to fully forgive those who hurt you. Now, a year after I graduated from Bible school and was out in the ministry, I was visiting my roommate, he had been in the ministry for a year, and he started a church that had grown up to be 500 people. And I was visiting him and uh, fasting and praying at his uh, large uh, building. He had an extra room I stayed at. And there was a young man coming into the, uh, like a coffee house there, a place for people out from the street that wanted counseling or prayer or just a cup of coffee and Christian music and people would witness to them. And there was this young man that came in often. Once he came in with his fists bloody from beating up the faces of his mother and father. This young man was really demon-possessed. And when I was in this season of prayer and was just, just had a wonderful, uh, mighty sense of God's presence resting upon me, I came in from a prayer room to the general room where people could be, and he was sitting there. And when I came in, the wonderful, powerful presence of God came in with me. I was just, was just immersed in the Lord's presence. And that mighty presence of God filled the room. And when it came to him, he stood up. He lifted up his hands and he said, Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. And he was really calling on the Lord. And as he was really calling on the Lord and kept going and going, what amazed me was he was really calling on the name of the Lord. He was really crying out to God, but he wasn't becoming set free. And so I, 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 I prayed in my heart, Lord, what's the problem? You said if we'll cry out to you, we'll be delivered. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but... He's not getting saved. What's the problem? And then the Lord brought to my remembrance that he had said a few days before, I hate my parents. I hate my mother. And I felt the Holy Spirit bring that to my remembrance that the bondage holding him back from being forgiven is that he was not forgiving his father and mother. And so as he was there, and I, was, I tried to lead him in his sinner's prayer, it didn't work. He was still demon-possessed, but crying out to God. Then I said, pray and say, I forgive my parents. And he was really desperate. He'd, he'd pray anything I, I said. And he prayed, I forgive my parents. 
And then I said, say after me, I love my mother. Because that was the main one he had said that he hated, the main of his parents. And when he said, I love my mother, he, he just choked up and, and started crying. And, and he really meant it. And right when he said that, I love my mother, I saw from the side of this room a wind. Now, there were no windows, no open doors, but there was a wind of the Holy Spirit that blew in and came to his body. Wham! And when it hit his body, I saw dark things cast out behind him. And as those dark demons were cast out by the wind of the Spirit, he just relaxed and said, Oh, thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for saving my soul. He wasn't fully forgiven by crying out to the Lord. He needed to deal with some further business, and he needed also to fully forgive. So remember those two things. For our own life and for the people, we try to help. Now, most of the time, those two things will bring the answers that we need. But if that doesn't work, there is a step number three that sometimes can be very helpful. If you have not been set free from the wounds and the hurts of your past by calling on the Lord, by fully forgiving those who hurt us, then pray about seeking counseling and help. Sometimes we need help and guidance to gain healing and release. In James 5.16, it says, confess your faults one to another and pray that you will be healed. Go to an elder or a pastor and ask for prayer or for your mentor. Open up about this thing that has been in your heart for years that maybe you've been afraid of confessing. But if you will confess it and release it, that can be the beginning of a mighty breakthrough for your life. Now, in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, we are told that we are to draw waters from the well of salvation. And Jesus said uh, in John 4 that the living water of the Holy Spirit is to be like a well springing up to eternal life. When we're born again, the Holy Spirit places a well, places the work of the Holy Spirit. We're born again. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And with joy, we can draw water. We can praise God and, and find refreshing and release. If our well is in good condition. But you can study sometime later in Genesis 26, there were times when wells in the Bible were blocked up by enemies or by neglect. A well can fall apart, the dirt can fall in, and there's no more water to be seen. And if a well is blocked up, then we find in Numbers chapter 21, verse 18, that the Lord told Moses to gather the leaders of God's people and have them sing to this place that a well was to spring up. And part of their song that they sung was, the well that the princes dug, that the nobles of the people dug, the nobles with scepters, and with staffs. Now, you can't use a staff to very well dig a well. A scepter, you know, a stick with a round thing on the end, it's, it's not going to dig a well very well. But a scepter speaks of authority as a ruler. A staff can speak of authority. And those who have authority, a pastor, an elder, a mentor, they can use their authority in God to look into your life, to counsel you, and, and to seek to redig the well of salvation. Open up that thing that has blocked you from having the release of God's Spirit in your life. So please, if you find that you don't have a full freedom from the past, 
remember these three things. And these notes are on our website, on the internet, along with this PowerPoint that I'm using right now. Any of you can study it further, or you can teach it, or preach it yourself. But these three steps can lead us through to full release from any problem if we will really cry out to God, fully release, and sometimes if needed, get the counseling that will set us free. The Lord is our shepherd. He appoints under shepherds to get us up on our feet, to pat us on our head and say, go ahead, go forward that they'll encourage us when we're discouraged in hiding like Gideon in the wine press, that the word of the Lord will come, you mighty man of valor, go out to victory. That when we've fallen, the word of the Lord will come to us, go and sin no more. That God will lift us up from the valleys and will lead us on towards the mountaintops as he led, uh, as the good shepherd leads his flock on to prepare a table before us. So don't let the things of the past keep you imprisoned. The Lord wants to restore our souls and set us fully free so that we can refocus, we can revitalize, we can again have the right vision and dedication to press on toward the mark of the high call of God. And so, don't be like a wounded cat that fights against healing. No, we are to be like a trusting little lamb that will come to the embrace of our good shepherd. Let's always learn to open our hearts. Let's be ready to confess if we need to confess, to open up and give our past to the Lord. Or maybe in counseling to a trusted Christian leader. If we come to the Lord Jesus, he will never cast us out. We won't find him angry or rejecting or unconcerned. We'll find out what David found out and what God's people have experienced down through the ages. That the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. So let's use this as a foundation and focus for these next three nights to see our souls restored, to press on f further released in God, to rediscover God's fullness, to be at work in your life and in mine. Thank you. God bless you.